do we believe that the AI that can generate poem is like fundamentally different from us who can feel and see and create, come up with a poem. But if we don't understand exactly what sets us apart, can we say that for sure? Let's go to one of your favorite topics, Descartes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Descartes consider the fundamental value of a living organism of lying its thinking soul, not in its physical existence. And based on that thought, he defined that the reason for existence of human beings was the ability to think. And isn't that what AI is essentially about, which is a robot that could think? Is it can of AI be considered a living organism? Does that mean that, does it also support the view that AIs have better moral and ethics, just like what's expected to human organisms? Like how we should make the distinction between humans and AIs and artificial beings and our expectations? Yeah, that's, that's a big question with lots of directions we could go in with that question. Let me start by saying there's something uncartesian about your question in a way that I think is really interesting and important, which is that in your question, you're aligning life and thought. One of the things Descartes does, it's not just the mind-body distinction, he teases apart life and thought. Those are two fundamentally different things for him. Life is a purely physical phenomenon for him. It's mechanized for him. So there's not a deep distinction between a living thing and a non-living material thing. You know, mind, thought, that's a different matter, so to speak, or non-matter. So I think the idea of artificial life, he'd be fine with that. Although I think what he would suggest is something that has artificial life is a machine that's capable of respiration and digestion and reproduction of the life functions. That would be what artificial life is for him. But you know, he basically thinks that the living organism is just a really fancy, complicated machine. And dogs and animals, he thought that they were alive, but didn't think they think. So that's a really deep division. Biology is on one side, psychology is on another. And it may be that we need to rethink that disalignment. Maybe we really should think of them as going together. So on the life side, I think no problem with artificial life. I think he'd suspect that artificial, he did clearly think that artificial thinking beings is unlikely to happen, partly because he thinks no machine is going to be flexible enough. No machine is going to be able to learn something here and draw out the concepts and apply it somewhere else. Now, maybe he was wrong. We'll have to see. I don't think we're quite there yet. He was also interested in meaningful use of language. So is AI up to the task of understanding metaphor and creating metaphor and irony? You know, those are going to be the things that he thinks is going to raise the question whether the machine is really a thinking thing. He'd be open to it. But you know, the line between AI devices and human beings, I think there are there are some issues today where we need to worry about. If you don't mind, let me give you an example. <laughs> Something I got interested in a while back is artificial limbs. You know, we're creating them now out of biological materials that are and they're sentient, so people can feel sensations in the artificial hands there. So suppose you have one and I get mad at you for some reason, you know, you ate the last cookie and I wanted it and I destroy your artificial limb and you get mad back and you're going to charge me. Are you going to charge me with assault and battery or with destruction of property? Is that limb part of you or is it just something you own? I talk about this thing as my hand, but you know, it's not like my iPhone. It is me. So we need to think about those things as we develop the technology because legal issues are going to come up. Families are going to have to decide, do we start mourning or what? So like this kind of, I get the impulse. We want to cure cancer. We want to solve this. But all these other questions need to come along at the R&D stage, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it reminds me of the very famous metaphor that Daniel Dennett made in one of his books. We expect certain level of morality and ethical behavior to humans. We expect the same for humans with the same maybe artificial limbs, like artificial heart. But what if one of that person's neurons is replaced with a silicon component? 
are we still expecting the same? What if 40% of the neurons have been replaced? Or 51% of neurons have been replaced? And I think that leads to the question of if a robot or auto autonomous driving car commits a crime, can we put that on a stand? Yeah. Or should we put an engineer who programmed the algorithm on the stand? Or should we put the sponsor or a company who manufactured it on the stand? It goes back to where the center of the nervous system, center of the consciousness and the morality should lie in all those layers. Yeah. And I think that uh, your distinction of soul, body, and the thought, starting from Descartes, will probably help us navigate those complicated questions. I hope so, yeah. I mean, I wish there were clear answers to these things, but there aren't. And I think actually there are two things here. One is to think about what is our relationship to AI devices and what are our responsibilities to them in that terms? Because at the moment, like put aside the replacement for the moment, there are things that they do really well that we don't do so well and things that they don't do so well. So what's the right model of collaboration between the two? I think we would need that in place and then we can think about, okay, what do we owe each other and who's responsible for what? Then things do get more complicated if the AI becomes more and more like us. I'm still doubtful that it's going to get all the way to us. There's some things that we do that they're just never going to do. And I think actually in reverse too, they're doing things that we can never. So I think there are always going to be substantial differences, even if we start replacing. I wish I had a clear answer. I can give you my inclination, which is to think, I think the separation of mere continuity of consciousness that you could sort of upload and then download into an artificial brain and then maybe put that into a robot. I don't think that's what we are. I think that's a really important part of what we are. And maybe something most of the, the bots don't have is that subjective consciousness and decision-making and so on. But I also think our embodiment is critical to ourselves as persons. So my intuitions lie in the, if you're starting to replace all the body parts, that's getting us out of the human territory. And I was gonna, you're going to say, okay, replace your toenail, no problem. But <laughs> it's, these are tough questions. Right. And what troubles us here is that there is no clear consensus about what makes humans so special. Some people believe only humans have consciousness. And some people say, no, animals like mammals have consciousness. Yeah. Lizards have consciousness. And if, what, what's the definition of consciousness? Some people say that like <laughs> most of our behaviors and reactions is kind of pre-coded and it just kind of reflects and there is not much that differentiates us from the pre-coded machine. Is it really that special? Do we believe that the AI that can generate poem is like fundamentally different from us who can feel and see and create, come up with a poem? But if we don't understand exactly what sets us apart, can we say that for sure? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a good answer to that question. I mean, you're right. We have to be able to say what sets us apart and we're going to have continual challenges. I think those are still the things we cling to. And now what the heck is a will? You know, what is it to make choices? I think we do think we set laws for ourselves in a way that even Codex doesn't do. Codex can write code, but is it setting itself goals and laws? That does seem to be something distinctive of what we do. We do, as a matter of fact, hold each other responsible for our beliefs and actions in a way that we don't hold. Sometimes we hold Siri responsible, but usually we don't hold our gadgets responsible. Are we just fooling ourselves? What's the root of that? And that's the sort of thing we have to figure out. Right, yeah. I think those are all deeply rooted questions that can have fundamental impact on how we do our everyday things. And engineers create all sorts of gadgets and machines that can populate the world. Yeah, yeah. Thank you again for your time today. And I really appreciate your leading that embedded ethics program, not just for Harvard, but like many other universities and students were interested in learning from. So thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Song Yi, for noticing us and taking an interest in us. We're absolutely thrilled. And thank you for your support of us. Thank you.
where you have a trolley barreling down a track and one person is tied to one branch of the track and five people are tied to the other branch. And if you don't do anything, the trolley is going to crash into the five and kill them all. If you flip the switch, then the trolley will be diverted and one person will... And it's a very long-standing issue in ethics, whether it's permissible to flip the switch. And if so, why is it permissible?